the money we spend in running one service here, all the offering can't handle it. We tight put together to run one service. There is no week we don't spend more than four million. Ask them, they will tell you. There is no week. There is no week when you come and sit down under AC and you hear the word of God. It's not only prayer and study that makes it happen. Enough money makes it happen. But the reason we won't close down is because we have built our foundation. I rode from the bed yesterday, stood up around 1 a.m. And somebody sent something in six digits. 3 a.m. I said, well, is this person not sleeping? Why? He, they can't sleep. We have activated some laws. So even when they are sleeping, something will tap them. Why will you wake up 3 a.m. in the morning? Why can't you wait in the morning? There's a power. Anybody who makes a practice of receiving will end up poor. So Jesus gives to widows. But if the widow wants to shift her level, he is not receiving that we shift her. See the mentality the world has given us, selfish mentality. Some people are so happy when they keep receiving. Hey, somebody just gave me a car. When was the last time you gave a car? You will return to square zero. Hey, somebody just gave me 100,000. Our God is good. That is the status of a poor man. It is only the poor that keeps receiving. And Jesus said the poor you will always have. Did you not read your Bible? Everybody Jesus gave to was called poor. He said from time to time, they took from the poor and gave to the poor. But the ones that he made rich, he didn't give them. They gave him. That's why the widow was giving. He didn't stop her. Leave her to give. That's why her status will change. If we keep giving her, she will remain poor. This thing is a system. It's a divine system. People don't move because they don't give. Some of you in the last 10 years, you can count how many times you have given. That's why your blessings too can be counted. But for those of us who can't count our blessings, we can also not count how many times we have given. Sir, I can't count how many times I give in a day. If I want to do it, I need to open a register. I give as the day breaks and I give until the day is over. You know, when you look around you and you see the condition of many Christians, if you are not convicted about the things of God and if you have not encountered God for yourself, you may begin to doubt the veracity of the gospel. The things Christians go through sometimes is so pathetic that you begin to wonder if the things the Bible says about God is really true. From his love, his benevolence, his power. But you see, when you examine the scripture, there is no challenge on the authority or the efficacy of scripture. In fact, in one of the, one of the major topics in theology is the topic of the infallibility and inerrancy of scripture. It speaks about the inability of the scriptures to err. It speaks about the veracity of the word of God. And so everything the Bible says about God is true. The reason we don't manifest it most times is traceable to ignorance. And this is why teachings are very important. I'm telling you, if you go to the hospital today and you see the number of helpless and hopeless Christians, you will begin to wonder if the price on the cross is true and if how it is taught is so but you see the truth is everything the bible says is true god cannot lie and every scripture is the breath of god so both the scripture and god are true so christians believers are going through what they are going through because of ignorance if you look around you today and see the poverty of christians who God has committed kingdom advancement to, you will wonder how they will ever advance the kingdom. Sometimes it appears as though we were set up when a global mandate was committed to us. Because the Bible made it clear. It said, my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. But when you see the hardship of Christians, many people barely have what to eat. How do you now talk about kingdom advancement? So you begin to wonder, is it true that God blesses? Is it true that salvation covers for our poverty? Does God really want to make us prosperous? Has God really made us prosperous? If it is true, why is so many of us 
walking largely in lack. If we take a census here tonight of those who have debts they need to pay or of those who cannot even eat, you will be shocked. And so the question is, do we have a father who cares? And if he does care, does he have the ability to provide? If we take a census here tonight of those who are sick, you will be shocked the number of people who are having one or two health challenges. So does God really heal? Has he the power to heal? Or is the Bible a scam? The good news is that the Bible is not a scam. The Bible said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. God does not deny us. He said, we are still his people, but the major reason we are destroyed is traceable to our ignorance. And everything God provides us is accessible on the platform of knowledge. He said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according as his divine power had given us all things, not some, all things, that pertained to life and godliness through the knowledge, through the epignosis of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And when the Bible speaks of God's power, we are not just talking ability to do some things and not some things. God is omnipotent. Revelation 19.6 said, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Jesus said, Is anything too hard for God to do? He said, With man is impossible, but with God. All things are possible. So it's according to the power that makes all things possible that we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. So power with God is not lacking. Provision is not lacking. We are not accessing because of ignorance. And so tonight, I want to advance spiritual precepts for prosperous living. And I pray that somebody will understand it and that somebody will engage it. Listen, whether you will remain where you are for the next five years or move to where you ought to be is a function of what you know and the degree to which you apply it. God has made it clear from scripture his desire for his children. In 3 John verse 2 is one chapter. It says, Beloved, this is Paul writing, John writing to the church and this is his salutation trying to give us the heartbeat of God he said beloved I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospered this scripture alone gives us the full range of prosperity soul prosperity which is growing in God, knowing God, living above sin, and then bodily prosperity, which is health, and then circumstantial and relational prosperity, which is the first thing he captures there. So in God's agenda, there is prosperity package for every component of your being. And so if there be any aspect of your life where you are not enjoying abundance, that is an alarm system that there is ignorance lurking somewhere. And so we need to examine the scriptures again, particularly tonight, to find out how God prospers a believer. Now, for the purpose of my teaching tonight, I'm not going to touch um, soulish prosperity. I'm not going to touch bodily prosperity. I'm only going to touch material prosperity. But I'm laying this foundation so you will know that we know and we teach that prosperity is not materialism. Prosperity is first of all growing in the knowledge of God. That's why I said your soul, even as your soul prospered. Prosperity is living a healthy life. Victory over sickness. And then prosperity is having an impactful relationship with others. A life that impacts others. And then prosperity is also having circumstantial victory that you are not walking in lack. But because we can't deal with all of that tonight, I just want to handle only material prosperity. But for the purpose of emphasis again, let me state that spiritual prosperity is more important than bodily prosperity. And bodily prosperity 
is more important than circumstantial or material prosperity. In Mark 8, 36, Jesus speaking, he said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? That means, if you prosper materially and prosper bodily, but you don't know God or grow in God, all of that is a waste. However, it's also important to note that Jesus was not in any way trying to say bodily prosperity and material prosperity is not important. Because when you study the Bible, the same Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, and all other things shall be added unto you. In fact, the price that was paid for sin is the same price paid for your health. And is the same price paid for your material prosperity. In Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 4, see the way the Bible puts it. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In verse 5, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. So you see that same price paid for your sins is the same price paid for your healing. Peter reiterated it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He said, by his stripes, you were healed. And Paul came back to add the third layer. In 1 Corinthians 8, 9, he said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The same grace that brought salvation. The same grace that brought healing. He said, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he became poor that you and I might be made rich. And if you study the context of that scripture, he wasn't talking about the soul. Because Paul was talking about the church in Corinth. And the emphasis was about material resources. So he was talking about our material resources. So it's the same grace that deals with sin, that deals with sickness, and deals with material prosperity. So as far as God is concerned, he deals with poverty with the same severity with which he deals with sickness. And he deals with sickness with the same severity with which he deals with sin. The problem with a Christian is that when it has to do with sin, he puts on all his guard and he fights it with all his faith. But when it has to do with sickness, he lowers the, he lowers the standard. When it has to do with poverty, he lowers the standard. And that's why we are where we are. And so the emphasis of the teaching tonight is to let you know that you must prosper. Not just in your soul, but in your body and in your circumstances. But there is a protocol. Look at the first man that God created. In the garden of Eden, God gave him everything. He had relationship with God. He had health. He was working in divine health. And then he didn't have any lack. That is God's plan. So God wants you to grow in your relationship with him as much as he wants you to be healthy, as much as he wants you to have impactful relationships, and as much as he wants you to walk in material increase. Adam had it all. When he fell, he didn't just lose his relationship with God. He also lost everything. He lost health and he lost material resources. He was kicked out of the garden because the thing is a full package. God does not give one and leave one behind. When he gives one, he gives all. And when you lose one, you lose all. This is why many people who are born in for God, at some point, they become frustrated. You know, some people think, oh, this thing, we are spiritual men. You are joking. When you talk, they say salvation is free. Try to take it to somebody and see how heavy it is. We are going to Kujé for a crusade. Those who we answer the altar call, we say salvation is free and they are correct. Now, ask us who will take it there. We will tell you that the thing is expensive. Number one, Jesus paid the price. Number two, it costs millions to bring it here. This is why you cannot but prosper holistically. And this is why it's God's agenda. Some people say Jesus' death has nothing to do with material prosperity, that Jesus didn't come to prosper us. Really? If Jesus didn't come to prosper us, why then does he expect us to give for kingdom advancement? Where will we get it from? Would that be fair? If God has nothing to do with our prosperity, why will he expect us? The Bible said, cry out loud, Zacharias 1.17, and declare, 
my kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. How does God expect us to take the kingdom to nations, to systems, to the whole earth, and to every generation if he has no system of prospering us? Do you think that gospel is correct? If we are handicapped, how can we advance kingdom? Whereas the Bible clearly states, it is the blessings of the Lord that make it rich. Proverbs 10, 22. And added no sorrow to it. Paul was speaking in Philippians 4, 19. He said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So through Christ, God supplies all your needs. Is your financial needs not part of your needs? How many, some of you need financial need, have, have financial need more than every other need. Do you know how many things you have used money for only today? So you cannot deny it. It's hypocrisy to deny it. And it is captured in God's plan. So we need to understand how to live prosperously. Number one, because the first man God created, he prospered him. Number two, because the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus covers your material prosperity. Number three, because the covenant also insists that you prosper. Now that I have mentioned the covenant, I need to establish a balance. You know, I told you on Tuesday that God is not in covenant with us. But we are children of the covenant, right? Hope you understand it. So the reason we practice covenant is to grow into maturity. Not because if we don't do it, we'll be cursed. Are you following this? And I gave you, okay, let me give you scriptures. Acts chapter 3 verse 25. I didn't plan to go very deep in that, but let me touch it. You are children of the prophets and of the covenant which God has made with your fathers. This is the apostle writing to the Jewish people. Even the Jewish people, God already made them understand that this covenant is with Abraham. However, they were enjoying the benefits because of the covenant with Abraham. And they were practicing it because they were children of the covenant. Not necessarily because of them. However, they didn't understand the depths of that revelation. Now, when they were crying in Egypt and God showed up, he said, I have heard your cry from heaven by reason of your affliction and the pains of your tax masters. He said, therefore, I am come. And how did he introduce himself? The God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. So is Abraham he had covenant with. However, because they didn't know anything about God's relationship and patterns, they were laboring under a lot of yokes and curses. So Paul came back in the New Testament and began to give them light. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul canceled out the covenant of Moses and the covenant of Abraham in one scripture. In Galatians 3 verse 13 and 14, he began to teach us. He said, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law, being made a cause for us, that for it is written, cause be everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come, not just to the Jews now, but to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So our duty is to believe in the transaction that God had with the one he had covenant with. Are you following this? I'm trying to take you through a route. So Paul is telling us here that the way we come out of the yoke of the Mosaic covenant is to trust the one God had a covenant with. And he captured it that it was Christ. But you will not see it in this scripture. If you read down to verse 26, 27, 28, and 29, you will now see what Paul said. He said, for you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Why is Paul emphasizing Christ? Because Christ was the one God had covenant with. Are you seeing this? He tried to have a covenant with Abraham. He couldn't keep it. He tried to have a covenant with Moses. Men couldn't keep it. He tried to have a covenant with David. They couldn't keep it. So God decided to have a representative among men. So God became man in Christ Jesus. And God kept the covenant. So we now become offsprings of the transactions that happened between God and Christ. This is why Christ was the one who paid the Mosaic covenant 
by dying on the cross and removing the cause. You are now a product of that interaction. And then when he spoke about the Abrahamic covenant, he said, for as many of you that have been baptized in Christ, he said, you have put on Christ. You have put on the DNA of Christ. So Christ is your representative. You are in Christ. Your duty now is to receive the blessings. Verse 28, see the way he puts it. He said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. This thing is no longer about race anymore. He said, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. He said, for you are one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29. He said, and if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. What was he in, in, insinuating here? He's insinuating something. Jesus is the one who represents man in the covenant. And if you go into your scripture and you read from Galatians, I'll read another scripture. Okay, let me go to Hebrews. Hebrews, if you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, help me quickly. This is not my emphasis. Give me Hebrews 9.16. He said, for where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. Are you following this? Next verse. He said, for a testament is of, is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength. Why the testator leave it? What he's telling you here is that the covenant that God had with man was effected when Jesus paid the price in death. Because every one of us failed. We couldn't keep it. So Jesus came to keep it on our behalf. So he was the one who fulfilled the claims of divine justice. And it was at his death that he finalized the contract of the covenant. See, if you study covenants, you're going to find two things. The first thing about a covenant is that two parties must sign an agreement. And that agreement is bound by an oath. Now, when God signed that contract with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, if you read from verse 6 to verse 18, you will discover that when the agreement was to be signed, Abraham didn't sign. The Bible said when it was evening, they cut the, the animal that they used for the covenant. Because the way they did it in ancient time is that you carry the animal, you divide it into two. So both parties will walk through. The blood will stain them as they are owed. They are taken to keep the demands of the covenant. When time came for Abraham and God to walk through, only God walked through it. You know what God did there? He converted that covenant to a will. Because when it's a will, one person signs. And the other person enjoy the benefits. So the way the other person receives it is by believing. This is why Abraham didn't keep any rule. Abraham believed God. Because Abraham didn't sign the contract. Abraham, God alone signed the contract. So the covenant became a will. And then when Paul was talking about this same will, he said God was not talking to all the children of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, if you read from verse 15 to 16, he said God was talking about his child, which was Christ, one person. So Christ was the one that the promise was meant for. Now when Christ showed up, the covenant now reverted back to an agreement. So Christ had to keep the demands of justice. This is why Christ must die for sin. This is why everything God demanded, Christ must do. And Jesus said, lo, it is written in the volumes of the book. I came to do thy will. Even when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it were possible, let this cup pass me by. He said, yet not my will, but that. Because now he needed to keep the covenant. It was not just a will. For him, it was an agreement that he must keep. The moment Christ kept that agreement, the Bible said, every one of us who believe in Christ became the children of God. So God is not negotiating with us. And that's why I gave you an illustration of myself and my wife. I said I was, I'm in covenant with my wife, but my son is the child of that covenant. My son is not swearing fidelity with me. I swore the oath of fidelity between myself and my wife. But my son is a product of the oath that we swore to ourselves. Are you seeing this now? If I give to my wife, it's a, it's a responsibility that the covenant mandates. But if I give to my son, it's a responsibility that love and fatherhood mandate. 
Are you following this? So my son did not sign any agreement with me. My son will only believe in me as his father. Now, you now ask the question, which is why I'm dealing with this. Why then should my son practice the covenant? Because the transaction going on between me and my wife is based on mor moral values. We defines who we are. If my son does not practice it, he will not grow in morality. So I will not lie to my wife because the covenant negates it. I will not hide anything from my wife because the covenant negates it. I will not be unfaithful to my wife because the covenant negates it. When my son begins to grow, I will also teach him honesty. Not because he's following a rule, but because that must be his nature. If my son is growing, I will teach him fidelity. Not because if he's unfaithful, he will be cursed. But he has to learn fidelity because that's the character that defines our covenant. So for we who are Christians, we are not practicing covenant because if we don't, we'll be cursed. Jesus has taken the course. We are not practicing covenant because if we don't, God will kill us. Jesus has already been killed. We are not practicing covenant because if we don't, we will fail. Jesus has already taken every shame on our behalf. But we are practicing the covenant now because it's the nature of God that defines the agreement. And if we don't practice the covenant, we will not grow to maturity. And if we don't grow to maturity, there are many things God cannot commit to us. Because in the new covenant, prosperity is an entrustment. And so God will entrust prosperity to you to the degree that you prove yourself mature in God. So God is in covenant with Christ. The Lord said to my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So the agreement was between the father and the son. But when Jesus died, I came out. When Jesus resurrected, I manifested. So I am the product of that covenant. This is why the Bible calls us heirs of the promise heirs of the promise, heirs of salvation, heirs of the blessing. So we inherit it. Are you following this? I'm saying this to clear the ground because when I start talking about covenant practice, don't make the mistake of thinking from the line of Moses that, oh, if I don't do this, I'm cursed. No, you are not cursed. Jesus has already been cursed. But if you don't do it, you are not mature. Things cannot be entrusted to you. Are you following this? Don't view this from the line of the law that, oh, if I don't give, I am finished. Devourers, curses, famine, all of that doesn't work anymore. Jesus has taken it. But it's in your engaging it that God can trust you. Because now God knows you are mature to handle kingdom things. Because the covenant is also the character of God. That's what defines the agreement. Do you follow that? Does it make sense to you? So the Bible said we are what? Children of the covenant. That means we inherit God's blessings. We don't earn God's blessings. We inherit it. But everything we inherit is levels of maturity that determines our possession. Are you following this? Are you following this? The one who earned, the one who qualified, the one who passed the test of God was Jesus. But you have become an heir. Now that you are an heir, it belongs to you. However, it is maturity that determines it. Everything I have belongs to my son, but I can't give him everything now. If I give him the car now, he will kill himself. I can't give him certain amounts of money now. As I am now, I can give my son millions. But I can't give him now. What will he do with it? If I give him, he will implicate me. He can carry it and go out and start playing with it. And armed robbers will say, oh, there's money here like this. And they will cause damage. If I give him, he can even tear it. Something that should, you know why? Because it's not yet mature. That's why the Bible said the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant. So the point I'm making is that all the blessings of God are already yours, but most of us are children. So God cannot entrust us with kingdom wealth. It is God's plan, but it will take maturity to command it. The protocol I will teach you here are covenant-oriented protocols. But I need you to understand that the reason you engage them is because of maturity. Not because if you don't, you will be cursed. It's the man who is in covenant with God that if he doesn't keep it, that will be cursed. Not because if you don't, you will be killed. It's the one who is in covenant with God that if he doesn't, he will be killed. You are a child of that covenant. The reason you are keeping it is because the character of that covenant is your DNA now. So your doing it is your growth in the things of the spirit. Does that make sense? So having explained this, let me go quickly to the protocol of prosperity. The protocol for prosperous living. 
this is what many Christians don't know. And this is why they struggle. If you know this and you engage this, you will prosper. And brothers and sisters, I beg you, prosper. You get why? If you don't prosper, even your conviction, you may lose it. Oh. I'm telling you, see, I've seen many people burning for God, but certain things happen, they began to question. Ah, ah, is this thing real? I've seen people before who were consistent with God. A point came, lack of transport fare made them to stop coming to church. There are many people who should have been here, they can't pay for their transport fare. And they cannot even buy data to watch it. Not because they don't love God. And because they can't transport themselves and can't afford data. After one month, the thing will no longer be in their heart. They will now replace it with something else. And before you know what is happening, they are in one corner smoking. And then you are wondering, how did you get here? Poverty brought him there. Not the devil. Lack brought him there. I've seen many people who went into wrong acts. Because they couldn't take it anymore. He can endure hunger. But he has a three-year-old child. Who is crying and nobody is willing to help. He has no choice. He had to do something. That's why he stole for the first time. Not because of himself. But he can't see his child going through pains of hunger. See, prosper, my brother. He has a reason. Without prosperity, you can't advance God's kingdom. Without prosperity, even your faith can be challenged. Without prosperity, you can't live a quality life. You cannot. And without prosperity, there are many things you can't do. See, there are many people burning with fire to win souls. They don't have the resources. They want to win more souls than we can ever imagine. But one crusade costs several millions. Several, several, several millions. So they cannot organize any massive event for God. Not because they don't have the heart. They don't have the means. This is why prosperity is a must. And this is why God puts it as part of our everyday life. We need to prosper. And don't prosper in a season. Don't prosper once in a while. Prosper always. There is a system that increases a man daily. Your prosperity should be daily. Daily. And there are forces in God that makes that happen. The question is, are you willing to engage them? There are two systems of material prosperity. Number one is the universal system. And then number two is the divine system. Universal system of prosperity cuts across three things. Number one, productive wisdom. If you don't produce anything, you can't prosper. Anybody you see today who has financial power is producing something. So this one, you don't have to need God. Universal prosperity is indirect empowerment of God. And the problem with universal prosperity is that man takes the glory. So for example, some of the billionaires in the world don't know God. But somebody has set up Facebook. Somebody has set up Twitter. Somebody has set up Apple. And every day millions come because you are using Apple. Because you are using Facebook. Because you are using Twitter. So long as you can produce something, you can prosper. And every one of us breathing must engage universal prosperity. I've taught you before that we relate with men at the level of men. But when operating at the level of men fail, then we shift to the God zone. That's the advantage we have. So we don't negate this. Please, as a Christian, let your hand do something. Even the Bible said, whatever your hand finds to do, it said, do it well. And the Bible said, the Lord will bless the works of your hands. So God has regard for what you do. What I'm about to teach you here does not encourage idleness. Anything your hand finds to do, that means your hand must find something. You must deploy yourself to producing something. Produce value. The information I'm giving you here is value. And there are things that come because of it. I've been in my room since 12 o'clock. I didn't go out of one room from 12 to 5. It took me 5 hours to cook what I'm giving you here. Somebody will hear this and say, wow, this is rich. And it will give me something because of it. It's called universal prosperity. Are you following? You must produce something. That's first 
law for universal prosperity. Number two is talents and gifts. Some people are struggling today because they are rusty. You have a voice. You think that voice is just to sing in your parlor. You are joking. God didn't give you your voice to sing in your parlor. You need wisdom to market your gift. Because a lot will depend on it. He said a man's gift maketh room for him. So if you don't manifest your gift, you have no room. The degree of empowerment you enjoy is the degree to the manifestation of your gift. And this one is not about God. God gave it generously to the whole creation. Because every flesh is an offspring of God. I was reading something yesterday and they said... A boxer fought for 20 minutes. Five minutes. The whole fight was for five minutes. And he made 50 million dollars. That's the that's gift. That's the excellency of gift. What a gift can give you in minutes. Hard work won't give you in a lifetime. 50 million dollars. Anthony Joshua. Five minutes of fight. Which, which institution can pay that? No one. Only gift and talent can pay that. I was told that people like Cristiano Ronaldo earn about 6,000 euros every minute. And I'm wondering, I tell you what he earns in a day. You can put all the professors in one school together, they won't earn it. That's the, I'm not, a, see, hard work is good, but wise work is better. That's why <laughs> you need to deploy your gift. Don't joke with what I'm telling you. I'm, see, the giftings in this room, this room alone, is enough to sponsor Nigeria for 100 years. You know the problem? 98% of it is in its crude state. And nothing crude has value. Even crude oil has no value. It is when it is refined that value comes out of it. There are many people sitting here that if they use their hand to do anything, you will wonder if it's a God that did it. There are many people here, if they sing and you hear their voice, but the devil has put a cast on them, so they never deploy that gift. And they are moving around begging and saying they are helpless. So when they approach God and say they are helpless, God is wondering, you are a good man. Who told you you are helpless? What you need is to refine it. And this is why you hear messages like this, to stir you to go back to what you have. You will be shocked. Look at Nigeria. How did we shift in the media world? Suddenly some boys emanated from worry and started making people laugh. And from making people laugh, laugh, they turned it to an organization. And today they are all millionaires. See, God is not taking the glory, but it's a universal prosperity. So that even the man who is godless can be blessed. That's the level of God's generosity. So he puts a gift in everybody. There is nobody seated here today who has no gift. And if that is the case, nobody here has an excuse to be poor. It doesn't matter the family you came from. You can be born poor. It's not your fault. But if you remain poor, you are the person to blame. Not even the devil. Because every one of us here is multi-gifted. The problem is we are not paying the price to refine it. Every time refining is in view, there is a lot of suffering and pain. If crude oil is to be refined, different products come out at different temperatures. Petrol does not come out at the same temperature as butane. Butane comes out at a different temperature. Or the whole liquefied natural gas. They come out as a diff at a different temperature. Petrol comes out at a different temperature. Diesel comes out at a different temperature. You know what that means? If you expose yourself to pressure, value will come out. But it's the degree to which you expose yourself that will determine what comes out. So somebody may have diesel. Petrol, bitumen, and liquefied natural gas, he will produce only diesel. And his life will operate at the level of diesel. If you want more influence, if you want more glory, expose yourself to more pressure. It may take hours of reading. It may take years of mentoring. It may take years of study. It may take years of apprenticeship. But by all means, put yourself under that pressure. Every pressure refines you. And your gift becomes sharper. I've taught you before, Gentiles come to your light, but kings, they don't care about your light. It is the brightness of your rising. So your gift must make you stand out for you to command certain level of influence. And then number three, under universal prosperity, is heritage. 
There are many people in the world who have no gift. They have no wisdom. They are producing nothing. But their father produced something. So you see them driving a Ferrari. You say, what do you do? He says, it's my father's wealth. He will pay you, but there's nothing you can do. <laughs> you are not the man's son. It's DNA that makes that one happen. It's my father's wealth. He wakes up. They say, they call those ones, those born with silver spoon. So if you are not born with silver spoon, begin with what? Productive wisdom. And then go to what? Sharpening your giftings and talents. These things are very important. But they are called what? Universal system of prosperity. See, they are good. Except that in the universal system of prosperity, God does not take the glory. And what is the importance of what you have if God will not take the glory? If you are the one taking the glory for what you have, that does not impact your eternity. That means you will be wealthy in time, but poor in eternity. Did you read the story of the wise fool? The guy applied all the principles of productivity. He said, now my barn is filled. I have to rest and find rest for my soul. And heaven addressed him, you fool. So anybody who engages only universal prosperity is a fool. You know why? He has no wealth in eternity. He said, tonight your soul will be demanded of you. And he was caught up. The guy who had abundance on earth was looking for a drop of water in eternity. So you can be rich on earth and poor in the world to come. And so in order for you to be both wealthy on earth and wealthy in eternity is the reason why you also have to apply divine prosperity system. Because God also has his own system. The difference between divine prosperity and universal prosperity is that in universal prosperity, God's enablement is indirect. So God can put a talent in you. You may never meet God, but you discover that talent. God can put you in a nation where things are working. And then you study, refine your mind, get a good you know, opening and begin to prosper. God is indirectly involved. Whereas in divine prosperity, God is directly involved. The second difference is that in universal prosperity, man takes the glory. But in divine prosperity, only God takes the glory. Because you are applying the principles of God. And tonight, I want to share with you quickly on the protocol for divine prosperity. Or protocol for prosperous living. There are five things I have outlined here that if you do, you must prosper. If you do, and you will not just prosper, but your prosperity will ascribe glory to God. Number one protocol of divine prosperity is to clearly identify God as your source. I have a talent, but my talent is not my source. I have a job, my job is not my source. The psalmist said in Psalm 23 from verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. This is the source. Now, I've taught you before. Hope you know this guy talking is a warrior. He can go to war and come back with spoils of war. Hope you know this guy talking is a king. The whole wealth of the nation belongs to him. But he was smart. It is not my battle skill that prospers me. It is not my kingship that prospers me. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, why do you think he oppressed like this? Read the scripture to the end. You will know why he decided to choose God and not any other thing. See verse 2. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. So he's telling you that there's a force that creates opportunity for me. I don't have all the wisdom to create all the opportunities I need in life. The opportunities that come my way, some of them I don't deserve it. But it is that God who is my source that makes me to lie in green pasture. Number two, he said he leaded me beside the still waters. That means I am wealthy with peace. I am not wealthy with pressure. I am not wealthy with turbulence. The kind of wealth I have is one that comes with peace. Remember the Bible said, it is the blessings of the Lord that make it rich and added no sorrow. That means many other types of blessings exist, but they come with sorrow. 
This is why you find wealthy men today. They are looking for women to sleep with every night. They are looking for drinks, alcohol to take every night. They are looking for a place to go on vacation by all means. They are gambling. They want to do something because they can't manage the pressure in the soul. Today, there is this. Tomorrow, there. So, there is turbulence. But a man whom God is his source, he leads him beside the still waters. There is a peace that you cannot explain. The Bible said that peace surpasses knowledge. Go to verse 3. He restored my soul. You see what this prosperity costs? This type of prosperity makes you turn to God. There are other prosperity that make you turn away from God. Have you seen people who prosper by their giftings? You see loftiness, you see pride, you see arrogance. The more wealthy they become, the more godless they become. But if it's God that sources you, the more wealthy you are, the closer you are to God. Because what he's doing is not just in your bank account, it's first of all in your soul. He restored my soul. He leaded me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So there's a prosperity that makes a man holy. It's not every wealthy man that is a ritualist. It's not every wealthy man that is godless. It's not every wealthy man that is a gambler. It's not every wealthy man that is a womanizer. The men that God prospers, they walk in the path of righteousness. Oh, let's go to Job. Job 22. Read from verse 21 to 29. I'll come back to this scripture. See the way the Bible paints it. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto you. So, you are not pursuing good. It's coming to you. Because you have acquainted yourself with him. See verse 22. Take it all to 29. He said, receive I pray thee the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thy heart. Next verse. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, and thou shalt put away iniquity from thy tabernacle. Verse 24. And thou shalt lay up gold as dust, and the gold of offer as the stones of the brook. You know what that means? Do you know what it means to keep dust away from a place? Clean a table now. Come back five minutes, dust is already there. Clean it again. Five minutes later, dust is already there. So there is a type of prosperity that pursues you. It's the prosperity that leads you in the path of righteousness. He said you will lay up. See, somebody will lay up dollars as dust. See, when we are talking wealth, it's not I have 10 million, I have 20 million. It's not every month. I'm talking as you are sleeping, money is coming. As you are going about, money is coming. You wake up, you meet money, you sleep, money is still coming. There is a realm like that. And there are many operating like that. He said, you shall what? Lay up gold as dust. This is the prosperity the psalmist is talking about. And this is how it is if God is the one blessing you. Go back to Psalm 23 verse 4. That's not all. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. So there is a prosperity that defies season. When every other person is failing, you can't. You can't fail. You don't have seasons of failure. Your move does not fluctuate. It goes up and up only. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a warrior? Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a king? Are you seeing why this guy did not choose the prosperity that comes from a gift? But the one that God is the source. Because if your gift, if it is gift-based prosperity, if it's production-based prosperity, if it is talent-based prosperity, if you enter the valley of the shadow of death, you are finished. This is why many billionaires crash. Because when they enter the valley of the shadow of death, see, there's a place where money can't talk. Only the presence of God can make the difference. Money is important, but the channels your life will take you through. Some of them, money will be helpless. Did you not read that in Egypt, money failed? So when you come to that point where your wisdom can't work, your connection can't work, if God is your source, then he will rise up for you. And say, even in the valley of the shadow of death, I still bless. The guy didn't stop here. He went further. Verse 5. He said, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, there's a prosperity that doesn't care who likes you or who hates you. 
They can gang up against you. You are going forward. They can support you. You are going forward. This is why the Bible said all things work together for good. See, before you quote scriptures, know why. All things will work together for good for you if God is your source. If you love God, if you are called according to his purpose. I'm showing you why Christians quote scriptures yet they think. Because there's a difference between quoting scriptures and knowing truth. A man who does not recognize God as his source is singing, the Lord is my provider. When things now go wrong, he says, Lord, why? This is why. The prosperity that comes from God is one that insists that God must be the source. That means you give glory to God for what you have, not your talent, not your wisdom, not your hard work. All of those things will be in place. And that's why I told you to start from there. However, you know that if it is for your talent alone, you won't be where you are. I was talking with my wife this morning and I just shook my head. The same thing I'm doing, I've been doing for the past 10 years is what I'm doing now. I've not changed it. Same thing, this gospel that I'm preaching. Apart from maybe I was teaching and receiving some peanuts which I've stopped. Which is supposed to have reduced my capacity. Same thing for the past 10 years. But you know what? What I have given from January to March. I have not given it in 10 years. That means the first 3 months of this year. I have prospered more than I have prospered in 10 years. See there is no way to explain it. Not because I, I went and did a new deal. I went and broke out the same thing. But there is a way God works. The more you grow in faithfulness, the more he multiplies it. And then you see that capacity is increasing, resources are increasing. Not because you have become super creative. He is just remaining your source. You are giving him more glory. You are believing more in him. You are working more with him. And you see that unexplainably, things are just happening. And the way God works, by the time I get to December, I would have done... Now, if I say what I've given in three months is more than what I've given in ten years, I hope you know that the last ten years is more important than the last twenty or twenty-five years of my life. So I'm trying to tell you that what I've done in three months is more than what I've done in a lifetime. By what means? The economy is becoming harder and harder. And so when things go bad, you just feel for others. As much as you can, you help them, but not you. Because the water that destroyed the world is the water that lifted the ark. It depends on where you are standing. <laughs> when, when, when people are going through hardship, we feel for them. We support them as much as we can, but not us. Because what we are working with, even in the valley of the shadow of death, we prosper. In the presence of our enemies, we prosper. I have fought more battles in the last three years than I fought in the last ten years. I didn't notice. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Many don't know. See, no one blesses like God. He says, the blessings of God that make it rich and add that no sorrow to it. Proverbs 10, 22. Philippians 4, 19 say, my God supplies not some of my needs, all my needs. See, even the, when the Bible says all your needs, it's not the ones you know. Because there are many needs you have that you don't know. So when he says all your needs, even the ones you don't know, he supplies it. But the key is for God to be your source. And this thing is not just about talking. It's about consciousness. Because your life will show it. If you have something and it makes you too busy to come to God's presence, that thing has become your God. If you have something and it makes you too busy to pray, that thing has become your source. So a man who says God is his source makes God his priority. Nothing takes the place of God. That's the meaning of this scripture. Even as a king, David was going to the tabernacle to pray daily. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The first key for prosperity is to make God your source. You know the question Jesus asked them in Luke twenty-two thirty-five. 35. He said, when I sent you out, Without purse, without script, without sanders, did you lack anything? And the people say, no, we lack nothing. If God is involved, there will be no lack. The reason we are suffering lack is because God is not our source. So the first protocol 
for divine prosperity is to make God your source and prove it in your life. If that becomes the case, it's over. The devil has failed. No matter what happens where you are or who rises up against you or whatever plans, it will fail on arrival. I don't care if anybody carries my name to a shrine. I don't have time to pray for such things. Take my name there. See what will appear. That's when you will know who powers me. See, there are some prayers we don't pray. The reason you pray some prayers is because God is not the one behind you. If he's the one powering you, let them curse you. Let them take your name to a shrine. Let them gang up against you. They will not see you. It's the one that defends you that will rise. He said, there's no enchantment against Jacob. There's no divination against Israel. Is it because Israel is praying? No. He said, the shout of the king is in their midst. When you rise up against a man, God defends. It's God that rises. If, you, if there's a security system in your house and thieves come, will you the one that will show up? Are you the one to show up? It's the security system that will respond. God is my keeper. And so when a man wants to fight me, he will fight God first before he comes to me because he's my keeper. He's my defender. And the reason God is so is because I made him my source. Most of us have not made God our source. That's why it's difficult for us to obey. That's why it's difficult for us to create time for him. And that is the root of our poverty. The second protocol for prosperous living. Please hear this and make decisions. There are most of us here, our jobs don't let us pray. You are the one I'm talking to. There are most of us here, our businesses don't let us evangelize. There are most of us here, it's been long we stayed in God's presence. And even if somebody invites us, we are checking our watch. Ah, I have a meeting. I have this. You are joking. You will do well until you come to the valley of the shadow of death. That's where human connection fail. That's where money fail. God help you that he shows up. If he doesn't show up for you, then you will see how pathetic. Have you not seen the wealthiest men in split second circumstances sweep them off? Number two, the way the system of prosperity works is that you connect to it by faith. You are the one to connect to it. It won't connect to you. When electricity is made available, you wire it to your house. That's how the system of God works. You connect to that system. He makes it available universally and he makes it available divinely for his children. But it is those who connect to it by faith that we enjoy it. And most of us never connect to God's system. Matthew 9, 29. Jesus speaking, he said, Be it done to you according to your faith. I can do all things, but what will happen to you is not according to what I can do. It's according to your faith. So how much you can draw from God is the faith that you can exercise. Most of us don't know that everything we ever require has already been made available. What we are enjoying now is the one our faith can carry. So this prayer of bless me, bless me, bless me without taking faith-based initiative is a waste of time. Have you not been praying it for more than five years? Ask those who are prospering. They will tell you. See, the problem we have is those who don't have the experience are the ones trying to justify it. So every time you are talking about the blessings of God, it's the poor that are arguing that this thing doesn't work. All this thing is manipulation. All these things is uh, 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 fanatism. Oh God, how much do you have? Those who have don't argue. He's working for them. When God told Moses to tell the children of Israel to give, the Bible said they gave daily. You know why? When they gave and saw the result, they came back. This thing works, so they add some more. And they go and come back and kept doing it. Those who are doing it, why do you think they are not stopping? You think it's because you are wiser than them. They are seeing results that are supernatural. So they know that this thing has power. This is why they are connecting and they keep connecting by faith. Mark 9.23 All things are possible, not only to God. You know the Bible says with God all things are possible. But as you begin to walk in faith, you will now discover it's not only with God that all things are possible. Jesus said all things are possible to them that believe. So any area of your life where faith comes alive, you will see results. I was telling Pastor Godwin some, uh, some days ago, I said the reason we command results in the area of holiness, purity, 
righteous living, fire for God, is because that's what we emphasize. And if we keep emphasizing it, after 10 years, some people will die of sickness. Some people will die of poverty. Because it will not be in their consciousness. And so they will not deploy faith in that area. If you say, let's pray now. We can pray from now till tomorrow morning. It's when we are sweating. That's when we charge. When you think, oh, these people should go and eat. No, that's when the fire go up. So we have built capacity in the area of prayer. We have built capacity. See, there are some of us here in this meeting. Seated among you here. If you like being naked, they will look at you and say, get out. You are not serious. The appetite does not exist. They are not trying to keep themselves. No, they have deadened that appetite in God's presence. There are many people here. Try to bribe them. They will be angry with you. The holy fire in them is intense. But if you bring a challenge of 40,000, they will crash. So a man who is tall like a cherubim in, in, in holiness, tall like a cherubim in prayer power, cannot deal with an issue of 40,000. 40,000 is like a mountain to him. You know why? He doesn't know how to walk the faith that commands financial result. There are many people who can pray and bring down a building. Somebody has headache. They are shaking. They have prayed everywhere is shaking. You say, this brother can't hear on his left ear. They say, eh, what happened? Okay, let's pray for him later. Oh, guys, not later, it's now. The Bible says now faith is. Which one is later? The God who can do it later, can't he do it now? You know what? They don't have faith for help. The moment they feel any pain here, and you say, ha, is it us, sir? They say, oh, I don't know. Oh, baba, baba, hey, baba, oh, 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 oh. That prayer is fear. They don't have faith for it. So you see the guy is holy but sick. He is holy but poor. Because the way the system works is you address each with specific protocol. So if you want to connect to God's system, you connect to it by faith. And we are in a generation where the world has adopted the universal system but antagonizes the divine system. So anytime you are talking about blessing, they say, if you don't work, you will not be blessed. All these pastors are deceiving you. Because they want us to reduce church to business school. This is not Harvard Business School. If you talk prosperity and you are not talking about talents or creativity, they say, forget those things, they don't work. They think we should cut off divine operation and adopt universal, and ab adopt a universal operation. No. When you are talking about divine healing, they say, forget to better exercise yourself, eat well, and take drugs. Don't let any pastor deceive you. Because they want us to adopt universal principles and negate divine principles. We are not negating universal principles, but we will not take off the one God has given us. Church is not hospital. So my job here is not to teach you which drug to take to be healthy. That's the doctor's job. My job here is not to teach you the exercise to do to be healthy. That's the job of the gym instructor. My job here is not to tell you to rest, to be healthy. That's the job of a therapist. When you come here, I talk to you how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. When you come here, my job is to tell you, casting down imagination and every high standing thing that opposes itself above the knowledge of God. I have my own principle. I'm not against the principle that is universal. But I also know I have my advantage. And many pastors have watered down spiritual things. Because they want to be accepted by the world. And so every time they talk spiritual things, they talk it from a universal level. Work hard. Do business. Some people, pastors, will even tell you that don't let anybody deceive you that God blesses. Really? Is it deception? So what do you do with Proverbs 10.22? That said the blessings of God make it rich. What do you now do with 1 Corinthians 8, 9 that said Christ rich as he was became poor that you might be made rich? What do you now do with Philippians 4, 19 that say my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus? If hard work is the only way to prosper. They say, ah, if you don't sow, you will not reap. Really? How much sowing did Jesus do when he collected five loaves and two fish from the little boy? The last time I checked, the Bible said Jesus lifted it and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said take. And five loaves, two fish became food for 5,000 men and 12 baskets was left. Which agricultural principle did he practice? Which economic principle did he practice? 
The last time I checked, Elisha told the widow, the cruise will not finish. Go and make cake for me. And after she made it, they kept eating from one container until famine was over. The last time I checked, Israel was walking in the wilderness and they told God, give us food. And Moses was angry. Where do you expect food to come from? God said, don't worry. Tell them by this time tomorrow, they will have enough to eat. And manna came down. And they ate manna for a while. They now told God, we are tired of this manna. We want meat. Even Moses became terrified. Where do you get meat from in the wilderness? They asked for meat for one day. God said, I will give them meat for one month. And that same day, the Bible said God commanded the east wind. And he brought quails. Birds came into their field. They lined on the ground. Birds stood on top on beds. Birds stood on bed. They came and caught them. They ate meat until meat came out of their ear. How did God do it? And then when you are talking, a believer, you think prosperity is to apply only the principle that Mark Zuckerberg applies. If you apply only that principle, the same way he doesn't glorify God, not too long, you too will not glorify God. I'm not against productivity. I'm not against gifts and talent. I'm not against inheritance. I'm not against hard work and diligence. But I know that my God also provides. He provides all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Listen, sir. You are not a businessman. You are a spiritual man doing business. You are not an agriculturist. You are a spiritual man doing agriculture. You are not a lecturer. You are a spiritual man lecturing. You need to know that the spiritual comes before the natural. That's why you must apply faith if God will prosper you. The third protocol, sit down, is the protocol of obedience. Because when it has to do with prosperity, it is obedience that activates faith. John 2 verse 5. Whatsoever he tells you to do, do. That's the key. If you don't want to use hard work, which is good to use from time to time, if you don't want to use giftings only, which is good to use from time to time, if you don't have an inheritance and you want to operate by faith, the key is obedience. Whatsoever he tells you to do, he said do. And see the strange thing he told them to do. They needed wine. There are two things you are supposed to do. Number one, look for a seller and buy. Number two, look for somebody who brews wine quickly and buy. But he didn't ask them to do any of that. He said, fill these jars with water. Oh guys, no water they are looking for. It's wine they are looking for. If it's water, we wouldn't ask you. We know where water is. Fill these jars with water. Does it make sense? If you go there with a the natural mind, you will end up a failure. And this is why many Christians are failing. And they filled with water. He didn't pray. Now, fetch from it. Uh -uh. So why do I have to come and put it in the jar? Why didn't I take it straight? It takes obedience for the power to be released. Fetch from it. He didn't pray. And they fetched. Instead of saying drink. You would have asked me to drink. At least let me be sure. If it has not happened so that we can take second measures. He said take it to the governor of the feast. If you were that person. Trust me. So we go, but you will go back to Mary and say. Did you say that man is okay? <laughs> because what he's saying doesn't look like somebody who is okay. If you have another alternative tell me. I respect you. But that man I don't know where he came from. But the people understood that Mary was an honorable person. And if she said we should do whatever he tells us to do, we will do it. And so they carried it. The moment the governor of the feast drank, he stood up with a parable. He said, others before now, when they come to an occasion, they serve the best wine first. He said, but you have reserved the best wine for the last. You know what he's telling you? Universal principle is good, but it's nothing compared to divine principle. Universal principle is what? It's good, but it is nothing compared to divine principle. Whatsoever he tells you to do, do. God can give you specific instruction, but there are generic instructions he has given in scripture. And one of them is in Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, 
and running over shall men give to thy bosom. He said, with the measure with which you give is the same measure that will be meted back to you. This thing applies in judgment. It also applies in prosperity. And when Jesus taught it, the apostles adopted it. Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6, Paul began to teach, if you give sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you give bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Why is that so? He said, every man, go to verse 7, according as he has proposed in his heart. So this time is no longer a law. Give 10, give 20, give 30. No. You determine where you want to operate from. According as you have proposed in your heart. He says, so give. Not grudgingly of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And in verse 8, he began to tell us the power that is released. He said, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound in every good work. So the instruction is give. So if you want God to prosper you, if you want to connect to divine system of prosperity, you cannot do without giving. The reason we are where we are is because we are wise in our own understanding. The Bible said the liberal soul shall be made fat. It said him that watereth shall by himself be watered unto. So in your life, God will not be able to do except as you give bountifully. And trust me, everybody has enough to give bountifully. The widow gave two might. And Jesus said she gave more than them all. Why? Because she gave all that she had to live on. Why didn't Jesus say, no, 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 you are a widow. We should be the one to give you. Anybody who makes a practice of receiving will end up poor. So Jesus gives to widows. But if the widow wants to shift her level, he is not receiving that will shift her. See the mentality the world has given us, selfish mentality. Some people are so happy when they keep receiving. Hey, somebody just gave me a car. When was the last time you gave a car? You will return to square zero. Hey, somebody just gave me 100,000. Our God is good. That is the status of a poor man. It is only the poor that keeps receiving. And Jesus said, the poor you will always have. Did you not read your Bible? Everybody Jesus gave to was called poor. He said from time to time, they took from the poor and gave to the poor. But the ones that he made rich, he didn't give them. They gave him. That's why the widow was giving. He didn't stop her. Leave her to give. That's why her status will change. If we keep giving her, she will remain poor. This thing is a system. It's a divine system. People don't move because they don't give. Some of you in the last 10 years, you can count how many times you have given. That's why your blessings too can be counted. But for those of us who can't count our blessings, we can also not count how many times we have given. Sir, I can't count how many times I give in a day. If I want to do it, I need to open a register. I give as the day breaks. And I give until the day is over. But I didn't start like this. See, people look at pastors and say, is it not tight and offering? Open a church and try it. Maybe you should Google and find out how many churches closed down in one year. You will know that tight and offering is never enough. See, the administration of tithing is for welfare of the priest. But I can tell you, many times, it doesn't solve half the problem. The money we spend in running one service here, all the offering can't handle it. We're tight, put together, to run one service. There is no week we don't spend more than four million. Ask them, they will tell you. There is no week. There is no week. When you come and sit down under AC and you hear the word of God, it's not only prayer and study that makes it happen. Enough money makes it happen. But the reason we won't close down is because we have built our foundation with giving. I have given until I have given all. Even God knows there is nothing that I am asked for now that I will pray about. I have passed that level. Some of us, no material thing is a sacrifice anymore. We have passed that level. Sacrifice is for children. When they are giving, they say, see, when there is a level you grow to that it becomes your breath. It becomes your life. Sometimes I carry my phone. I say I have not given to God this week and I don't have a reason to give and then I sow a seed. I call it honor seed. Sometimes I sow a seed, I call it love seed. Sometimes I sow a seed, I say gratitude seed. I don't know why, I just need to give something. And ask my wife. I rode from the bed yesterday, stood up around 1 a.m. And somebody sent something in six digits. 
3 a.m. I say, is this person not sleeping? Why? He, they can't sleep. We have activated some laws. So even when they are sleeping, something will tap them. Why will you wake up 3 a.m. in the morning? Why can't you wait in the morning? There's a power. There's a power. I'm telling you, we are not making progress by coincidence. We are more making progress by definite intelligence. And that intelligence is around giving. We don't just give cheerfully. We don't just give consistently. We give bountifully. I can tell you the shape of my harvest. Because I know the seeds I sow. If not for security reasons, I would have told you some things. But see, we, we, you need to apply wisdom. I would have told you some things. I know where God took me from. And I have, I know diligence. I know productivity. I have labored with my hands and I keep laboring. I started paying my school fees by myself from 200 level. I have a PhD. So if I tell you that even students prosper, I know what I'm saying. We are not, these are not cunningly devised fables. It has worked in our lives. I just started ministry two years ago. Ask them, Pastor Sonny, have you ever paid me salary? I don't need no salary. I have never worked for any ministry and collected salary. All my years of training, I learned these principles early. Nobody who earns salary becomes big. The key to wealth is to give. It shall be given unto you. As a youth copper, I gave all my allowance. All. I didn't save one dime. And I'm not saying saving is not good. Save, invest. There are channels. But you see, some of us knew superior laws. We knew them. Early in life. From 10 naira to 20 naira to several millions. Without thinking about it. And we are moving and moving. We are moving and moving. There are people who reach out to me sometimes. They say we have been trying to reach you for two years. I think maybe they, they have cancer. They want me to pray for them. Why? They say, sir. Please give me your account number. I want to bless you. Is that why you have been looking for me for two years? Then look for me no more. I am here. And people who don't know spiritual things are saying tithe and offering. Sir, I have people who pay me every month. Every month. Not from Nigeria. From different nations of the world. Doctors. Businessmen. The moment is first of a month. They send an alert. And I look at it. The Lord bless you. You deceive yourself. Think it's tight and offering. Be joking. Deceive yourself. Think it's by pastoring. There are many hungry pastors who can't pay their children's school fees. Ask those who live around me. I give like a madman. That's what I was taught. And the people I follow. This is what they did. And that's what they keep doing. You keep the little you have, you think you will go anywhere. The widow had what to eat to die with her child. And if she ate it, she would have died. Give it and save your life. The moment she did, death went back. She fed until famine was over. See, God has his system. And that system responds to your obedience. And the first realm of obedience is the giving realm of obedience. any man who is wealthy and see the level of giving that is under their foundation. It's a secret. Not hidden, but many can't understand it. Now, how do you give? Let me show you. You don't give carelessly. There is a way to give to command results. And I give you seven of them. Number one, you give from the place of love. Only love motivated giving produces result. If you don't love, don't waste your time. You must love God to give to God. Don't come to God with a transaction mentality. He said, if I give, it shall be given unto me. So you don't have any relationship. You just want to manipulate God and get hundredfold. He said to the crafty, he will show himself crafty. If you want giving that produces result, let it be a response of your love for God. 1 Kings 3, verse 3 and 4. And Solomon loved the Lord. And he gave a thousand bond offering in the high place of Gibeon. It began with love. If you don't love God, your giving will amount to nothing. 
Some people give for pride. So that they'll say, this is the biggest partner here. Ah, this man gave one million. You are joking. You go nowhere. There's no blessing for it. And Solomon loved the Lord. When a man is giving, what God is checking is his heart. I've quoted for you severally. Matthew 6, 21. He said, where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. That means God is tracing the heart along the treasure. First Corinthians 13, verse 3. He said, I can give all my resources to the poor. I can give my body to be burnt. He said, if I have not love, I have nothing to gain. So the kind of giving that produces result is a love motivated giving. And that's why when you give, don't look for men's applaud. Your result will prove what you are doing in the secret. There are some people, if they give and you don't call them to announce their name, they are offended. They will never give again. You won't prosper like that. For you to give and your gift produce result, give from the place of love. Number two, how do you give? Give willingly. Any giving that is coerced is a failure. This is why churches where they manipulate people to give, they give and remain poor. Because giving must be willingly. If you are coerced, if you are manipulated to give, there will be no harvest. We read already from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. He said, when you give, don't give grudgingly. Don't give of necessity, but willingly. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Make sure you give willingly. Exodus 35, verse 4 and 16. When the children of Israel gave, the Bible said, Moses commanded them, those that are of a willing heart, let them give. And the Bible said, the people gave willingly. Anytime you want to give and there's pressure, stop. That giving is a waste. Every time you want to give and it's for ego, stop. Don't waste that resource. It will waste. Every time you give, let it be that I want to advance God's kingdom. I want to show my love for God. It must be willingly. I'm showing you what releases the power to get wealth. See, there's a power for wealth. Oh. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says you shall remember the Lord your God. It is him that giveth the power to get wealth. In the God equation, there is a power that make it rich. But there are laws. Give willingly. Number three, give righteous resources. Don't go and steal and give and say, God will bless me. You do Yahoo, Yahoo. You come, you say, God will bless me. In his mercy, he may. But that's not a guarantee. Because God will not take an offering that came from God will not accept that offering. He may just bless you because universally is a father and he blesses. But that is not even guaranteed. Because God is more interested in your soul that is, than is interested in your blessing. So give righteous proceeds. In Ephesians 428 he said let him that stole steal no more but walk with his hand that he may have to give. So don't steal. Don't fornicate. Don't do halotry. Don't do yahoo yahoo and say, ah, I've given you. Know, God bless me. What will he bless? Will God bless evil? Will God bless iniquity? Will God bless wickedness? No, he won't do that. By reason of his universal mercy, you may enjoy some of his blessings. But if he has to do with his direct impute in your life, forget it. It will not happen. So make sure you give righteously. The scripture we read from Job, 22 from verse 21 to 24 you see what the bible said it said acquaint now yourself with the lord it said if you turn to the almighty then you shall be built up it said then you shall put iniquity from your sanctuary then you shall lay up gold as dust don't be a thief and then say if you give it shall be given unto you you won't prosper let him that stole stop stop the stealing first stop the halotry first stop the yahoo yahoo first this is why i said this system is a faith system if Yahoo Yahoo is what you are doing, you don't trust God. He is not your source. Every one of us must be wealthy this year. This is why we need to understand this protocol. We can't do great things for God, poor. Salvation is free, but preaching the gospel is very expensive. Give righteously. Number four, how do you give? Give cheerfully, with joy. The Bible says in Isaiah 12, 3, it says, With joy you shall draw waters from the wells of salvation. 
1 Corinthians 9, 7. God loveth a cheerful giver. Give with joy. Don't give grudgingly. I know there's a place in sacrificial giving where the, the seed will touch you. That is good, but grow up to a level where you give cheerfully. See, when you give, find fulfillment in it. And that's why you need to know how God works so that people don't toss you to and fro. Make it a lifestyle. The Bible said, give a portion to seven. Give a portion to eight. You know not the evil that will come upon the earth. He said, in the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, withhold not thy hand. As much as it's within your power, scatter your seeds. Let it become your lifestyle. And see if your life remains the same. You know, in the New Testament, God puts our blessings in our hands. So that we determine how we move. Because the New Testament work is a faith work. And I'm telling you, as touching material resources, the reason we are working in lack is because we are not commanding the blessings that is available to us. Because the way to command it is through obedience. Number five, how do you give sacrificially? Psalm 126 verse 6, it says, Him that cometh in tears, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds. So it's not everything you give to God. Anything you give to God must be a worthy offering. That beareth what? Precious seed. See the way the Bible puts it. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Ask those who give precious seeds, they never come back empty handed. When Abraham gave Isaac, he didn't just return with Isaac, he returned with Jehovah Jireh. You cannot give precious seeds and return empty handed. It's not possible. And God looks out for how precious what you are giving is to you. Malachi chapter 1. Look at verse 6 to 9. See God talking. People don't know the character of God. A son honoreth his father. So this is not law. This is relationship with covenant children. A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Say the Lord of hosts unto you. O priest that despiseth my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised you? So this is God rebuking even the priest. So nobody is left out. There are many pastors who collect offering. They never give offering. They are shouting, offering time, blessing time, give bountifully. Check. They never give. That's why church folds up. That's why they become poor. Next verse. Verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. You say, wherein have we polluted thee? In, in that, ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Next verse. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? So what they don't need is what they give God. Some people want to give God something. They squeeze an old note that is useless to them and they throw it. You don't give to God like that. Oh. You don't give what is precious to you. You don't handle it like that. That's why we give you envelopes in church. To teach you how to manage what you give to God. It's a training in itself. It's a, and if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to your governor. He said, will he be pleased with thee? Or will he accept your person? Say the Lord. So God is saying, what you can't offer to your governor, you are bringing from, to me. Because you don't give precious things. People are careless when it has to do with God. If they want to give to a, a friend or a spouse or a, a, an honorable person, they prepare everything to make it show, showcase honor and dignity. But when it's in the house of God, they don't even know what they are coming to church with. When they say offering, they say, ah, yes, so. Somebody who is not deliberate about offering, can he give seeds and sacrifices? That's why we are where we are. Because these things don't mean much to us. And you know the way your mind works? Because you don't take it serious. Even when God is declaring your financial blessing, your spirit can't respond to it with seriousness. Because it's not a serious thing to you. It's not a big deal to you. So when you give, you give precious seeds. See, if you want to shift your level, these are the secrets. They never fail. Number six, 
How do you give? You give reverently. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. If you are giving anything and it's not in reverence and honor, please don't waste your time. When God blesses men, he's deliberate. And finally, give unendingly. Galatians 6.10 don't give today and, don't, and tomorrow you are not giving. No. Make it a lifestyle. This thing is a system. This thing is a way of life. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are in the household of faith. Every time you have opportunity to do good, especially giving, take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. You know why these things are important? Because these things make you spiritually mature, especially in the area of your finances. And I told you already, kingdom prosperity is an entrustment. And so only the mature can be entrusted with kingdom prosperity. But one of the ways God vets your maturity in the things of God, especially as it does with finances, is through these principles. So you activate that faith through obedience. I've seen many people who don't look like it. But when you come close to them, you will be humbled. Just because they engage these things every day. Some people think it's when you become great that you'll start doing this. No. If you wait for that, it will be in another life. You do this to become great. You don't wait to be great to start doing it. I've told you my story. God taught me to give from when 10 naira was my capacity. And I migrated to 20 naira, to 50 naira, to 100 naira. And we have been growing since then. Don't wait. Don't wait. This is a lifestyle. And so the fourth protocol is what? Obedience. Demonstrated through giving. And finally, is faithfulness. When God begins to entrust you with wealth... He also wants to see your faithfulness in handling it. If you are not faithful in handling wealth, God will withdraw it. I'm telling you, and many don't know this. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 to 2. Let a man account of us as of the ministers of Christ and steward of the mysteries of God. Next verse. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If kingdom prosperity is an entrustment, then you are a steward. So the degree of what God can give you is tied to the degree of your faithfulness in handling what he has given to you. Do you know that God blesses you to enjoy? But if enjoyment takes priority and precedence, it means you are carnally minded. And so there's a level of financial authority God can't let you enter. It's not against your enjoyment. 1 Timothy 6, 17. He said, tell them that are rich in this world to be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God that give it to every man liberally that he may enjoy. So God is not against your enjoyment. But if you spend 10 million on jewelries, you spend 4 million on food and diet, you spend 7 million on clothing, and then when it has to do with God's kingdom, your weight there is 250,000. It means you are a poor steward. You don't know the administration of kingdom resources. You know how these things work? Prioritize God and his agenda. When you do that, prioritize men and their needs. When you do that, prioritize your investments to generate more money. Then think about yourself. But some people turn the formula upside down. They prioritize themselves. Then they do little in investment. Then they do little or nothing to men and to the kingdom. That's why no matter where God takes them, they crash. God gives you 10 million, it must reflect in his kingdom. God gives you 10 million, it must reflect in the people living around you in your society. God gives you 10 million, there must be wisdom demonstrated in that part of that money is reinvested to bring more money. You can't collect 10 million and spend it. You will never see it again. 
you give a portion to God, give a portion to better humanity, and then invest a portion of it. Then take a little and spend. In fact, when you are growing in the cadre of wealth, enjoyment has a season. You don't begin with enjoyment. Enjoyment comes when you enter your rest. If you use the season of investment for enjoyment, you will come back to the bottom. You have never handled one million before. The first one million that came, you say, everybody, wait, wait. We must go out this night. And you spend 300,000. You say, my brother, man must work. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't hate yourself. You must love yourself. That's the last time you will touch one million. You get your first 10 million. You say, Kai, I saw a picture four years ago. They showed me a blue beach in Dubai. If I don't go there, let me die. And the next thing, you are looking for visa. You are looking for flight fare. You are coming back from Dubai. Your bank account remains 50,000. 10 million has gone. And then you come back later. You say, we are rich. We are taking over. The angels will look at you and say, you have blown your chance. You have blown your chance. But a man who is wise, he gets 10 million. He takes a portion and advance kingdom. He takes a portion and helps the needy. He takes a portion and invest. If he doesn't have investment, he saves it until he finds a meaningful investment. And then maybe he spends 300,000 or 200,000, get some clothing, buy some food stores, and put his life in order. That's a man that God can give 100 million. You know why? Luke 10, 16. Or Luke 16, 10. He said, if you are faithful in little, you will be faithful in much. So God will not take the risk to give you much if you don't demonstrate faithfulness in little. I'm showing you why the children of God are poor. The Bible said the sons of the world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Go and read the story of some of these great men. You marvel the level of sacrifice and investment they put in to be where they are. Sacrifice, thinking, hard work, investment. Why wouldn't they prosper? There's no faithfulness. There's no faithfulness. There's no faithfulness. Let me give you a counsel. When God begins to bless you as you practice these things, listen, the first part will be difficult because your faith will be proven. You may do it for two years and not have any return because it's a faith business. So God wants to prove your faith. But when your faith test is over and God now begins to give you mercy drops, you must do three things. Number one, create an investment channel. If you don't have an investment channel, create a saving system and think and get an investment channel. Number two, build a covenant lifestyle. You know what a covenant lifestyle is? You can tell yourself, every month I will give this portion for kingdom advancement. Do it anywhere you believe they are doing the work of God. Anywhere. It's conviction. This is an apostolic center. I'm not looking for members. It's not a church where we are fighting. This is my church. Some people are workers here. They are pastors of churches. Some people are here. They are missionaries. So this is not trying to fight to keep members. That's why we tell you truth the way it is. Anywhere you believe what they are doing is God. Open a covenant portal. There are people who do covenant practice weekly. There are people who do it monthly. There are people who do it yearly. Have a covenant system. 2% of my resources go for soul winning every month. 2% of my resources go for discipleship. 2% of my resources go for gospel uh, spread or advancement. 5% of my resources go for church building. Look for kingdom programs. Have a covenant connection. It shows your responsibility towards God. See, don't give once in a while. Those who do it don't grow. The way they trained us and guaranteed our rising is that they taught us this thing must be a lifestyle. So make it a lifestyle. If you can do weekly, do weekly. If you can do bi-weekly, do bi-weekly. If you can do monthly, do monthly. If you can do quarterly, do quarterly. But by all means, let it become a system in your life. Build covenant channels. It will fortify you. Nothing can bring you down. And then finally, open financial altars. 
Because any area of your life that has no altar can be attacked. Your business, open it an altar. You can go to an orphanage and invest 10 million there and say, I'm investing these things to better their life for the purpose of my business. This is my seed. If that business goes down, then the word of God is not true. You can go to a motherless home and adopt five children. I will train them to university level. This is my altar for my family protection. You will be shocked how God will preserve your inheritance. See, people who make impact have altars. Many Christians don't have altars, so their lives are porous. As I am like this, I have altars. Look for people who are anointed and you know that their life commands certain things. Go and plant something there. It's an altar. You know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 11? He said, if we labor to give you spiritual things, he said, is it out of place for you to return in carnal things? You know what Paul was saying? That investing in the anointed is a spiritual responsibility. But that's not all. Jesus spoke in Matthew 10, 40 to 41. He said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, he said, you will receive a prophet's reward. If you give a cup of water to a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, not as a gift. That's why I say it's an altar. Don't go to a man who carries a dimension and say, I want to gift you one million. I want to gift you a car. He doesn't need your gift. When you go there, give to him as a prophet. Give to him as a righteous man. He doesn't even have to be a pastor. You see somebody, did you read about the Shunammite woman? She didn't know Elisha was a prophet. The man was passing. She said, I perceive in my spirit that this man is a holy man. And she went to her house, prepared a room for him, put a bed and a table, and stopped the prophet. He said, anytime you are passing, please rest here, eat and spend the night. She didn't know that she was preparing for the day of trouble. The first thing that happened was that famine came. She lost her wealth and became ordinary. It was Elisha that spoke to the king on her behalf. That was not all. Another time, her child died. The same child that Elisha prayed for her to have, died. She knew it can happen. And she sent to the prophet, I was here without a child. You were the one who came here and troubled that a child should come. Now, this child has been taken. What will you do? If Elisha knows that if that child doesn't come back to life, she is in trouble. When you build altars on graces, those graces are channeled on your account. It's a mystery. Many don't know it. Elisha sent Gehazi. Take this staff. Salute no man on your way. Put the staff on the child. He will come back to life. But Gehazi was a crook. The anointing didn't work with him. He went, put the staff. Nothing happened. When nothing happened, Elisha didn't say, okay, maybe that's what God wants. No. Altars have been erected. Heavens must open. So Elisha stood up and came. And fell upon the child. Breathed on him. The child came back to life. The woman was not surprised. She knew what she was doing. Spiritual intelligence. Those days when we were learning the ways of God. If you find a brother fasting for three weeks. Praying in tongues for six hours. Sometimes you wait. When he finishes his fast and he wants to break, you bring food. You say, sir, Kai, the Lord is with you. You have labored. Please refresh yourself. Hunger. Nobody is thinking. Ah, thank you, my brother. He will eat. You have shared in what he did. You have shared. You know why? You are giving him a cup of water in the name of a righteous man. So you will receive whatever it is God gives him on account of that act. You will partake of it. That's why Paul said, concerning giving and receiving, Philippians 4.15, he said, no church communicated with me, but you only. In verse 17, he said, I did not receive this because I desire any gift from you. He said, I received this so that something might be credited in your account. In verse 19, he said, my God, not the God of Israel. This one is an altar you have erected on my grace. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ. People quote the scripture, they don't know the intelligence behind it. See, when you find righteous men, establish altars. When you find missionaries, 
establish altars. When you find servants of God, establish altars. When you give to widows, it's good. The Bible says, he that giveth to the poor, lendeth to the Lord. But when you give to the anointed, it's an altar. Don't give me. Look for anybody who is genuine. Try it. If it doesn't work, come back to me. I'm telling you how men rise. This is one of the secrets God told me that broke the spell of limitation in my bloodline. Ask those who are with me, they will tell you. When I find anybody who carries anything of God, I honor them. You don't buy it, oh. Don't make the mistake of thinking you are buying grace. That's wrong. You can't buy it. But when you honor a grace, when you honor God and honor a grace with substances, the reward begins to work in your life. These are secrets of prosperity. Many don't know it. That's why all of us are competing with the world to achieve universal prosperity. And do you know why we can't compete with them? Because these people are ready to compromise when they go and get stuff. You cannot. So both of you are bidding for a contract. Both of you have talent. But the guy can go and meet the MD later and say, if you give me this contract, I will bribe you with 10 million. You can't do that. This is why you too need to know what to resurrect from your altar. That's why you apply kingdom covenant. See, too many Christians are poor and they ought not to be so. We need giants to rise. Men who can command things at any level. But it begins when you grow through these protocols. Trust God. Make him your source. Activate faith through obedience. And that obedience principle is given. And then build covenant lifestyle. Erect altars. Don't let any part of your life to be porous. Some of us, before we married, we had altars. Before our children came, we have altars. Those who are with me here will tell you, the miracle of my son, from when he was seven months, he will carry my phone, watch my message for four hours. I'm not saying one year. Till now, he can't talk. Give him a phone now. He, so long as that phone is unlocked, he will go to, Bluetooth, to YouTube, check my message. He will sit there for four hours. Everybody who comes to my house will tell you. He will not leave it. See, sometimes he's watching it till 2 a.m. This guy is two years old. I'm not surprised. We have gathered his feet to walk in the path of God. All tasks have been erected. So his destiny, like Samuel, has already been galvanized. It's not just praying, Lord, do something. There are other ways to do something. It's by covenant and by altars. When you give, what happens? Quickly, as I round up. You know, the Bible said the blessings of God make it rich. It didn't say the blessings of God is riches. The blessings what? Make it rich. So there are things the blessing provide. If you don't engage them, you'll be poor. So this is the last thing on the protocol. Engaging the channels of the blessing. If you don't engage those channels, you can't prosper. Even if you give all. Number one is wisdom. 1 Kings 3, verse 3, 4 and 10, 14. When Solomon gave, the Bible said God asked him, what do you want? He said, give me wisdom to govern your people. And God gave Solomon what? Wisdom. So when a man begins to engage the covenant, what God does is that he gives him uncommon wisdom. Your engagement of wisdom is what will make you prosper. I'm telling you why now some people give and say we are giving, we are not prospering. It's because they are not utilizing the wisdom of God. The second thing that this practice will do is divine favor. Acts 4, 32 to 33. In the early church, the Bible said those who were possessors of land sold them, brought the resources to the apostles' feet and they said with great grace, God demonstrated his power by bearing witness to them. And he said they had favor with all the people. So when a man begins to engage these practices, one thing that happens to him is that favor rubs off on him. A great man died recently and a sister came to me crying. Why was she crying? God gave her opportunity to meet the man. And she didn't know it was favor at work. So she didn't seize it. Later when they were talking about the man's good works, that's when she started crying. Because if she had asked him for the little thing she wanted, it would have been granted. There are many people, God give them favor, they get carried away. So you meet a billionaire and he's asking you, how are you? 
you think is I'm fine is what he's looking for. You don't know how favor works. Some, they even go as far as, what can I do for you? They say, whatever you want. Well, I want you to, to be fine. So, goodbye. Be fine. They don't know how to use favor. The moment Esther stood before the king, the Bible said in Esther 5, 2 and 3, she found favor with the king. What do you want? She, need, she spelled it out clearly. So, favor will be useless if it's not utilized. And most of us have wasted favor. By favor, we have been brought to offices where we shouldn't enter. By favor, we have met people we shouldn't meet, but we didn't know what to say. And you know the problem with such moments? Sometimes they never repeat themselves. And some of us are there. We say only the wrong things. You sit with people that should change your life. Instead of you to listen, ask questions, or make demand, you are there talking stories. <laughs> yes, so even me too. The last time I was in the Jeboe day, we, we ate Gary. And you waste the resources of favor. But those who are wise, when you enter such places, you are looking for opportunity. You are looking for opportunity. And even if it's one that manifests, you will cash in on it. Your life will change forever. We don't know when favor has come on our lives. You find somebody in one week, you meet great, ten great men. You say, oh boy, when they see me, they know now. It's like the way I speak now. The thing is working. You know, when I was speaking, man, ah, everybody was just clapping. You know, I was so bold. You came back as poor as you went in. What did he achieve for you? Lack of intelligence. Number three, what the covenant does, divine direction. In 1 Kings 17, verse 8 to 16, when the widow gave, direction came immediately on what to do. Same thing applied with the other widow that had two sons. Direction came. Gather empty containers. Gather not a few. Lock the door. Begin to pour the oil. The oil will not finish. So every time you engage covenant, God gives direction. But you know the problem with many people? They have written 1,000 directions and directives. They've not applied one. Go to Lagos. Go to the island. I have something for you. They keep telling people. Yes, so yesterday God told me to go to Lagos. I'm still planning to go. The next time they will talk about it is five years. They never go. And they don't know that when the lines fall for you in pleasant places, it's because there is a heritage in view. Rise up. Go and greet this person. Hi. But this person, I don't know. They say people don't usually have opportunity to him. God said, rise up. Rise up. When you go, the door will open. We mess up with divine direction. That's why we remain poor. Even Elisha, the prophet, would have died. In 1 Kings 17, after he told the king, there shall be no rain or dew. Hope you know him too would have suffered the famine. But the Bible said the Spirit of God guided him on where to go. God led him specifically to a brook. It's as he went to sit there that the ravens brought bread. Your allocation is tied to your location. But it takes divine direction to find your location. And so the way God blesses is by giving you divine direction. By giving you instructions and guidance. But Christians trivialize instructions. One of my mentors is one of the most prominent men in the world today. Every time you listen to him is God said. God told me. God said. Sometimes in the bathroom. He said he was in the bathroom having a shower. And the Holy Ghost told him, arise. Get down to Lagos and raise for me a people from bathroom. He wasn't on the mountain. But he knew the priceless nature of divine direction. Some of us here have received five to ten instructions that we never obeyed. That's why we are where we are. With all of our hard work and intelligence, no prosperity. Number four, divine multiplication. When you give, God multiplies. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. When they needed food, it was a little boy that brought five loaves and two fish. You know what that means? It doesn't matter who is giving. Whoever gives, we enjoy multiplication. And a little boy saved a whole company. A whole company. When Jesus collected the five loaves and two fish, he gave thanks, broke it, and he multiplied. Fed 5,000 men, 12 baskets left over. Because a little boy gave. So, whoever gives doesn't matter. It is giving that matters. 
This is why those of you who are parents, teach even your children to give. When you go to church, don't give offering and leave them. Give them money and tell them to put it in the offering basket. Sometimes they will put it in the pocket, pull it out and say, no, put it here. Until it becomes their lifestyle. The day God will save your family from accident, the reason you may be saved will be because your four-year-old boy stood at the altar and said, Lord, protect my father and sold something. A young boy gave his lunch and the whole people were saved. Five loaves, two fish. Number five, what does God do? Divine encounters. Acts 10, 1 to 4. A man who was not even part of the commonwealth of Israel. The Bible said he kept giving. The Bible now said, your prayers and arms giving has risen up to heaven as a memorial. Immediately an angel appeared to him and said, go and invite a man. He will tell you what to do. What provoked that encounter? Prayer and arms giving. So your giving and your covenant lifestyle provokes encounters. And nobody, go and read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Nobody who had encounters remained the same. It's not every encounter that is sponsored by 40 days fasting. That is important. Some encounters are sponsored by giving. You read already 1 Kings chapter 3 from verse 3 to 12. Solomon gave a thousand bond offering. That night God appeared to him. What do you want? That means covenant practice mobilizes encounters. Number six, divine preservation. When you give, you are preserved. 1 Kings 17 from verse 8 to 16. The widow gave, she was preserved. You can't give and not enjoy preservation. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 27. God told Israel to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. But the king knew something. The Bible said when he tried and nothing was working, he took his son that was the heir apparent, sacrificed him on the wall. The Bible said immediately there was indignation against Israel. Israel began to lose a battle that God commanded them to go for. Because a man understood the power of sacrifice. You can change things through your sacrifice. You can change things through your love offering. You can change things through your giving. So God does not just empower you financially by your giving. He also preserves you. He preserves your heritage. And finally, giving opens doors of opportunity. The soldier... The centurion would not have met Peter. He didn't even know who Peter was. Except as his giving mobilized an encounter. And that encounter opened the door for him. From that day, he had access to Peter. Every time you engage this, you must prosper. And the reason you prosper is because it furnishes wisdom. It releases favor. It provokes divine direction. It orchestrates divine multiplication. It mobilizes divine encounters. It advances divine preservation and it opens up doors of opportunity. This is why God prospers us through giving. The question is, what is your weight on the altar of obedience? Prosperity in this kingdom is not local. The Bible said he has given all of us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Prosperity inclusive. But those of us who are handling it we are handling it because we are engaging the system. The devil wants to make the church poor. That's why there is an attack on the subject of prosperity and giving. Any pastor who talks about giving, they say he's fake. Anytime you preach about prosperity, they say you are falling. The only message we should preach is holiness. Holiness. And we preach holiness, we are completely financially immobilized. That's what the devil is looking for. My brother... God is as involved in your holiness as is involved in your prosperity. It was the same cross of Jesus that handled your sins. That same cross is what handled your healing. And that same cross is what handled your prosperity. Don't let anybody dissuade you from the secrets of the kingdom. The Bible said these secrets are hid for our glory. As much as is within your power, give and make it a practice. Don't give because somebody preached. Don't give because somebody shares a testimony. That's why when I teach like this, I don't call for seed. Because it's not about giving out of impulse. It's about building a lifestyle of giving. And giving correctly. And if I may, you'll give to God. You'll give to your parents. 
you give to the needy. That is poor, widowed, orphans, strangers. And then you give to yourself. Give to what? God and his agenda. Give to the needy. Give to parents and loved ones. Give to yourself. And also give to society. If you give like this, you cannot be poor. You cannot be weak. And you cannot be defeated. This is the secret that made for prosperity. Some people don't know when last they sacrificed. How can you now receive something big, which is a product of somebody else's sacrifice? God depends on us to do certain things. Not because he's not sovereign and able to do it, but because he's giving us opportunity to mature. And he's also allowing us to grow so that he can entrust things to us. Prosperity is part of God's agenda. Prosperity is a possibility. And you must prosper. You don't have to be 40 years old to prosper. Even at this level, you can prosper. Because wisdom has no regard for age. Favor has no regard for age. Divine direction has no regard for age. Opportunities have no regard for age. All the fringe benefits of giving does not have regard for age or gender. I decree and declare over your life the yoke of poverty breaks forever. I decree and declare over your life whatever it is in you that negates obedience to the demand of the covenant is broken from your life now. I decree and declare over you the power to prosper and prosper enough to be a blessing is released upon you now. Please hear this. If you don't want, want to remain poor, migrate from the level of receiving to the level of giving. Let receiving become the byproduct of your giving. Even God obeys this principle. He didn't harvest the world except as he gave his only begotten son. So God sold Jesus in order to reap the world. You cannot reap nothing if you've sold nothing. The power to sow in due season and to sow rightly, it rests upon you now. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Some of you listening to me now, you will give in millions of dollars because your capacity would have enlarged. If Jesus tarries, some of you sitting here, you will give to thousands of widows, thousands of orphans, thousands of strangers in the name of Jesus. If Jesus tarries, some of you listening to me now, you will sponsor divine mandate at global levels. You will build churches and you will sponsor crusades all around the world. In the name of Jesus. And if Jesus tarries, some of you listening to me here, you will become part of those who make financial policies for the world. Because you will go to that level. So let it be written. So let it be established in Jesus' precious name.